Hello, I'm Tarek Bezley and welcome to Downstream, the week's top stories from the world of science and technology on Al Jazeera. This week, has Bitcoin lost its way? We look back at a tumultuous year for the cryptocurrency. The internet have and have not, how people in a town in Italy have taken matters into their own hands. You are now moon base number one. And how to build a moon base using a 3D printing robot. But first, we start with a story from the Netherlands, where a group of scientists and engineers have come together to create a roading surface which generates electricity. They say this could be a power source for the future, and it's right there underneath our feet. They may not know it, but the people of the small Dutch town are riding over a project that has the potential to change the way we build roads and generate electricity. From a distance, a stretch of bike path like this doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary. But if you examine it closely, underneath this hardened glass, you can see the solar panels. Now on a fine day, a stretch like this, 70 metres long, produces about enough electricity to power three homes. The project took cheap, mass-produced solar panels and sandwiched them between layers of glass, silicon rubber and concrete. This version can have a, a fire brigade truck of 12 tons without any damage. And uh, we were working on, on panels for big buses and uh, large vehicles in the long run. The panels are connected to smart meters, which can optimize their output and feed the electricity to street lighting, to electric vehicles or into the grid. The research group spent the last five years developing the technology, creating slabs that were suitable for paving, but also dirt repellent and tough enough to endure harsh outdoor conditions. We made a set of coatings which is uh, robust enough to, to deal with the traffic loads, and, uh, but also give traction to the, to the vehicles passing by, especially for the bicycles of course, uh, and also uh, transfer as much light as possible uh, onto the solar cells, so the solar cells can do their work. Another project, also in the Netherlands, has also been exploring alternative roading surfaces. A tribute to the painter Van Gogh, this bike path near Eindhoven is lit up by glow-in-the-dark technology and solar-powered LED lights. But rather than focusing on beauty, the solar road team is hoping the economics of their product will be its selling point. Well, solar panels on roofs are designed or have a lifetime which is typically 20-25 years. Well, this is the type of lifetime that we all also want to have for these type of slabs, which means that if you have a payback time of 15 years, then afterwards you also have a, some payback of the road itself, so that makes the roads cheaper in, in the end. The team are working to refine the technology, but say that within five years they hope to offer a green and cost-effective road surface they say could pave the future. If they do manage to bring the price of those panels down, they say this technology could have broad application not only in cool countries, relatively non-sunny countries like the Netherlands, but also many countries closer to the equator that get a lot more sun. Well, we move now to the World Wide Web Foundation's Web Index. Came out this week. It uh, details the countries in the globe and their connection and use of the internet. 68 countries were assessed. The darker the colour, the higher they scored. The lighter shade shows those with poor connectivity. Denmark topped the list, followed by its Scandinavian neighbours Finland and Norway. At the other end of the spectrum, Ethiopia was ranked last. The report drew a strong link between poor web access and economic inequality. Not all Europe, though, is as connected as it could be. Roughly a third of Italians have never used the internet. That's one of the lowest rates of usage on the continent. Jonah Hull visited one Italian village where people have decided to do something about it. If you'd come to Verua Savoia, near Torino in northern Italy, eight years ago, you'd have found a village cut off from the digital world. Not everyone's idea of a bad thing, perhaps. Then all that changed, and this is why a scientific experiment began using recycled parts and borrowed bandwidth, bringing fast, cheap internet to this remote corner of Piemonte. Well, you have to imagine that here before us there was not internet at all. And the non-profit project now has a government license so it can grow. 
that. We wanted to use uh, this place uh, as just a, uh, an open lab, a living lab, uh, to test our equipment, our facilities. But we ended up uh, with something that had uh, a such important uh, social value that we translated uh, into a social experiment. Having the citizens participate in the uh, ownership and the distribution of the internet by themselves. Broadband has brought real change to Verua Savoia. Property prices have risen, they say, and the trend of young business people and entrepreneurs fleeing the countryside is slowly being reversed. The fact is that young people now can have more of what they have in the cities, and it's a good motivation to remain in the countryside. The internet has touched even the most sacred heart of the village. 85-year-old Don Corrado Cotti uses Google for his sermons and Facebook to keep in touch with his parishioners. It's not just important, it's very important because the village is very spread out. Everyone is far apart and this connection is a force that links families together. An astonishing 50% of rural Italy is still without an effective internet connection, the mountainous topography blocking the digital signal and these small pockets of population seen as not profitable enough for the big telecoms providers. The community-based internet model is breathing new life into the depopulated countryside. And that, in the end, does seem to be most people's idea of a good thing. Well, other science and technology stories this week include the Rosetta space probe has sent its first colour pictures back to Earth. It's orbiting around Comet 67P. You might remember a few weeks ago the European Space Agency sent the Philae lander module down onto its surface. Well, this is the first time we've seen colour images from the comet, but as you can see, it's pretty grey up there. And one of Apple's first ever computers sold at auction this week, $365,000. It was one of the only machines personally owned by Steve Jobs. He sold it from his parents' garage in California in 1976 for $600. And torrent site Pirate Bay was taken down this week. The best known peer-to-peer -peer site was raided by police in Sweden. It didn't stop the downloaders though. Other sites started to mirror Pirate Bay's indexing. And almost immediately, global downloads have hardly suffered a dent. Well, around the world, obesity is now a major epidemic, with around 5% of deaths being attributable to it. That's led a number of researchers to look for ways to suppress our appetite. My colleague Charlie Angela met some in London. Our expanding waistlines are now a weighty economic problem, a problem that will cost the UK as much as smoking and war, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. Nearly 30% of the world's population is overweight, in 15 years, it will be almost 50%. At Imperial College, scientists are working on a food ingredient to suppress our growing appetites, and it can be added to our daily bread. After 24 weeks of eating it, volunteers show less fat in their stomachs and livers than the control group. We are interested in a molecule called propionate, which is produced naturally uh, in the intestines when you eat dietary fibre. And we found that if you can maximise or produce more propionate in the gut, it leads to positive health outcomes. So people wouldn't have to change their diet and lifestyle in any way. But this can be added to what they normally would eat and it could hopefully have this preventative effect on weight gain. The volunteer's blood is taken and tested. And it shows an increase in the hormones that make us feel full. So this is where the molecule is mixed into the food. It's a white powder that doesn't smell of anything, but it tastes a little sweet. It's taken scientists four years to get it to this stage. And these are the kind of food products that they put it in. Fruit smoothies, fruit drinks, and bread rolls. So eaten on a regular basis, it could curb how much we eat by 10 to 15% a day. That's just enough to stop us becoming obese. But is this the solution for everyone? Chantal Daniel is a coach, motivating others to achieve their goals. What's the reason that you want to make this change? When she applied her techniques to herself, she went from 180 to 80 kilograms. But she says her problem wasn't with her large appetite. For me, it's about your mind and mentally thinking about why are you eating? Because very few of us um, eat because we're hungry. We just eat unconsciously. 
Modern life also has many of us reaching unconsciously for convenience foods, but experts say there's no single solution to the problem. These can stretch from fiscal measures such as taxation to reformulating measures which are improving the quality of food to weight loss measures to drugs, pharmaceuticals. This research has food companies excited, but it will be some years before the molecule moves out of the lab and into our lives. Well, a new study has revealed that there could be 10 times more plastic in the world's oceans than previously thought. Data from 24 expeditions was recorded over six years. They visited all of the world's oceans and concluded that more than 5 trillion pieces of plastic are in circulation. This weighs more than 269,000 tonnes, and most of this is so-called microplastic, small plastic particles measuring less than 5 millimetres in diameter. These can be ingested by fish, and the chemicals in them can end up in their cells. Well, a few years ago, I took a look at the issue of microplastic in the environment, in particular, how it gets into the food chain. Thrown out by someone and then washed up on the shore. When you think of pollution caused by plastic, the first thing that probably comes to mind are bottles like these. But a new study looking at plastic in the marine environment has made a surprising discovery. It's long been known that animals eat tiny bits of plastic, smaller than a square millimetre in size. The chemicals from the plastic can move from the stomach into the bloodstream and even build up in the animal's body. What wasn't clear though was where the plastic was coming from, that is, until now. The scientists found that the water in a washing machine like this one is full of tiny bits of plastic. They calculated that every time you wash a synthetic shirt like this one, around 2,000 microparticles of plastic are released. Looking at 18 sites on six continents, the researchers found the concentration of microplastic was greatest near large cities. Potentially these smaller particles could, for example, obstruct feeding, apparatus could obstruct digestion. We've shown that they're retained in the, in the body tissues of small marine invertebrates for periods of, of over 40 days, which is considerably longer than you'd expect for their normal gut transit. The other concern is that um, these small particles might act as a vector for the release of chemicals, chemicals that have been incorporated into plastics from manufacture. Microplastics damage the digestive tracts of organisms including fish like these. What's more sinister though is the way the chemicals can actually be absorbed into their bodies. It's feared as the world's population grows and there's increasing use of synthetic textiles this pollution will end up more and more on our dinner tables. Well, over the last year, the cryptocurrency Bitcoin has dropped in value from around $1,100 to under $400. It's led a number of commentators to say that the cyber currency has lost its way. I put the question to a couple of experts. There is a quite distinct reason why we saw a massive decline uh, in the currency round about March. Uh, this year, and that can be summed up in two words, Mt. Gox, which is the, ex the Bitcoin exchange based out in Japan, which at the time was responsible for over 50% of Bitcoin transactions worldwide. That went offline, it subsequently transpired that 850,000 Bitcoins had gone missing and only 200,000 of those were ever recovered. Well, Bitcoin increased several thousand percentage last year. This year it's down 50%, but it has uh, stabilized uh, between the, the four to $500 range. Um, and more and more companies are starting to uh, do research into how can we accept it. Uh, Microsoft is the most recent one and the largest company to date to um, mention that Bitcoin will be used for payments. What Microsoft's essentially doing is allowing people to top up uh, their account using Bitcoin. They're not allowing payment yet, but they're allowing the, their account to be topped up. Conversely, what PayPal is doing is allowing payment for uh, digital goods uh, on, the, on the, the PayPal exchange. We're also starting to see a few retailers. Dell are accepting Bitcoin. I think Expedia uh, is starting to, or is poised to accept Bitcoin. There are even rumors that over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, we might see Facebook 
coming into the space? It has to be easier to use. Um, right now, it's, you still have to be somewhat technically savvy to figure out how to get a Bitcoin and then how to spend a Bitcoin. Um, so eventually apps will integrate uh, more readily with people's smartphones that'll make it a lot more seamless to have Bitcoin and use it. And the advantages of using it are, are many once you're able to uh, make the process easier to do. Well, this week, 42 years ago, the last man walked on the moon. Ever since then, there's been interest in the idea of building a base on the moon, but the cost and the technology to do so has often held these plans back. Now a team in Europe have come up with an idea of using a 3D printer on the lunar surface to manage it. You are now moon base number one. The idea of a manned base on the moon has been around for decades, and not just in the realms of science fiction. NASA's Apollo missions gave the science community huge amounts of information about the lunar surface, but the vast cost of the program and waning public interest saw it axed in the 1970s. Now scientists are again looking towards the moon and to Mars. Once you leave Earth orbit and you've committed yourself to an asteroid or onto Mars, you've cut off your support and you've cut off your supply line from, from Earth. So you have to uh, be resourceful. This honeycomb-like structure was built by a robotic 3D printer. Scientists used a mixture of dust exactly like that found on the moon. They added water and a type of salt which turned it into a concrete. They say this could be done on the moon and could form the building blocks of a future moon base. The team say using a robotic vehicle, or a fleet of them, to mix and then squirt into place the moon concrete would be faster, cheaper and safer than using astronauts to do the job. If you would today build the moon base with normal technologies, you would have to bring to the moon all the materials, all the tooling, the astronauts, then to build the moon base there. With this technology, what you just do is you, sh you send the machine to the moon, the 3D printer to the moon, and then you use the dust that you find already on the moon to build the moon base around the machine itself. The concrete shield would protect the mission from small meteor impacts and block out dangerous radiation. On certain uh, parts of the moon and on planets like uh, Mars, water does exist and that really makes resupply a lot easier for uh, future astronauts. If the resources are already there, just take along the technology to extract them. We won't be setting up manned bases on other planets or on the moon for decades at very least, but when we do, new and innovative ways of building will be essential if we're going to turn science fiction into fact. Well, there's lots of other great content on our website. I'd like to point you to one this week seizing solar power. It's the story of a Latin American woman whose quest was to harness the power of the southern sun. She roams around the desert in South America spreading innovative technology including a kiosk she invented that cooks food using the sun's rays. You can watch the full program on our website. Well that's all I have for you this week. If you've enjoyed the show please do share this video and you can see lots more of our science and technology coverage at aljazeera.com. You can also follow me at Tarek Basley on Twitter. Thanks for watching, until next time, goodbye.